Well, what's up, online campus? Super pumped that you are joining us today. You picked an awesome Sunday to be here with us because we're kicking off a brand new teaching series today with our lead pastor, Danny Anderson, called Habits to Grow Your Faith. You're in for an incredible message. If you're brand new watching with us, I want to say welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. It is an honor. I'd love to connect with you. If you text the word hello to 65248, hello 65248. Love to send you a gift in the mail if you fill out a short, brief form online. But thank you for joining us. Say hello to one of our Impact team members in the chat. I know they would love to say hey back. Well, hey guys, I'm giving you a heads up. Mother's Day is four weeks away. Can you believe it? We just had Easter. Now it's Mother's Day right around the corner, four weeks away. Mother's Day is a really, really big deal here around Emmanuel Church. It's such a big deal that our Greenwood campus and our online campus are actually adding a Saturday night service at four o'clock. So make sure you put that on your calendar. Love for you to join us either in person or watching with us online. But part of Mother's Day is we also do something called baby dedication. And baby dedication is you as a parent just committing to raise your child in the ways and following Jesus. It's an awesome ceremony that you get to be a part of. So maybe, just maybe, you can drive to us. If you're watching online, sign up at one of our campuses. All of our campuses are doing baby dedication. But for more information about baby dedication, text DEDICATION to 65248 or just go to our website, eclife.org. It is right there on the front of our page. So I hope you can be a part of Mother's Day weekend. Make sure you bring a friend with you. Text INVITE 65248 and bring and invite a friend. But that's it for me for now. We're going to go worship together through singing. If you're at our e-microsites, what's up? You guys are awesome. Let's stand to our feet and welcome to Emmanuel Church. Come on, church. We came here today to praise the one true God. His name is Jehovah. We sing it out. We sing. He shames every idol. And he reigns. He reigns without rival.
decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turn. We declare it together. We have decided to follow Jesus. I have this oh, my mind's made up to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The cross, the cross before me, the world behind me. Well, the cross before me, leave the whole world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning. I have to say, I have decided, we say, we say, to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow, we make a declaration. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no. No turning back, we say, no turning back, no turn if you mean we sing it together, no turning back. No Thank you, church, for worshiping with us online. Come on, is there any other place you'd rather be? I know there's a million things pulling for your attention right now, but is there any other place you'd rather be than worshiping our Creator? Thank you again for worshiping with us online. Well, this Sunday is a momentous occasion for one of our campuses. And believe it or not, our Martinsville campus, they're one year old this weekend. How awesome, incredible is that? But check this out. Like, we don't just launch campuses to launch campuses. There's no reason for that. The reason we launch campuses is so that we can see more people come to Christ and grow in Christ. More people in cities and towns that we haven't reached yet. That is why we launch campuses. Why we launched Greenwood East just a couple weeks ago. Well, Martinsville, check this out. In the year that they've been open, 
21 people have texted SAVE to 65248. 21 people are going to spend eternity in heaven because of the Martinsville campus. 17 people have been baptized. 359 people have texted the word hello. They came to our church for the very first time and wanted to connect with us. They had over 500 people at their Easter services just a couple weeks ago. And because of your giving, we're able to do some massive renovations to their building over the past year. You should see the before and after pictures. Your giving matters. Your giving matters because 21 people are gonna see Jesus and spend eternity with him because of what is happening at the Martinsville campus. Can we give it up for Martinsville? How awesome is that? Well, thank you so much for being a part of everything that we do here at Emmanuel Church. And maybe you're sitting there like, I want to be a part of what God's doing. I want to be able to be someone that can launch more campuses because nine and 10 campuses are right around the corner. I know it. I believe it. And so the two easiest options can be done right there on your phone. Uh, you can go to our website at eclife.org slash give. And right in the middle of the page, there's a little button that says give online. Click that button, enter the amount and go from there. Or you can just text the word give 65248. You get a secure link sent to your phone. Click that and you're on your way investing in the kingdom of God. And maybe you want to start small. We created something called the $10 giving challenge. It's awesome because you get to see your $10, a recurring gift each week, grow into a mighty harvest. See your $10 reach more people and see people come to Christ and grow in Christ. So thank you so much, church, for your generosity week in and week out. All right, enough of me. We're gonna launch into our brand new teaching series with our lead pastor, Pastor Danny Anderson, Habits to Grow Your Faith. He's got a challenge in store for all of us. Before we hear from him, will you join me and let's pray together. God, speak through Pastor Danny. God, give him the words to say as we uh, hear about the power of your word. God, um, just motivate us internally. Uh, create a joy of your salvation within our souls so that we can become more like you. And God, thank you for what you're, you are doing and will continue to do at Martinsville campus. Thank you for our church and their generosity and giving week in and week out. Uh, we just are humbled that you use us to build your kingdom. Thank you, church. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you have given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, how you feeling today? Pretty good? How about this weather out there in central Indiana? Oh man, we've been waiting for this. So, so excited. Hey, I'm pumped to be with you here today. We've got a brand new series for you. I get super pumped when that happens. I got some extra energy for you. But before we dive in, just want to welcome all of our campuses really quick. If you're watching at our Banta campus, our Franklin campus, our Garfield Park campus, if you're watching at our Seymour campus, you guys are about to get into your building on Mother's Day. Can we give it up for Seymour? So excited for you guys. If you're watching at Martinsville, if you're watching at Greenwood East, I want to say hi to you. Hey, last week when Pastor Beasley gave the message, I uh, had the weekend off. I went to Greenwood East and hang out, hung out over there. Uh, so special hello to you guys. Can we give it up from Greenwood East today? Great things going on over there. And if you're watching online or here at Stones Crossing, uh, we want to say welcome. Also, if you want, if you're joining us at one of our microsites, uh, we have nine microsites meeting this weekend. I can't even not list them all, uh, so I'm not even going to try. But if you're wondering what a microsite is, it is basically a small gathering people, 10 to 15, sometimes 30 to 40 people gathering in a home, uh, in a storefront, sometimes in a Holiday Inn. Uh, and it's sort of like the startup of a campus to see it birth. And so uh, it's very, very exciting. We have nine of those meetings today. If you're watching at a microsite, we want to welcome you as, as well. Can we give, give it up for those watching at a microsite today? 
uh, and if you haven't been back in a while and you don't know who I am, my name is Danny, and uh, I have a beard, and it, it really is me. Uh, so I heard uh, last uh, service that somebody's like, hey, where's Danny? It's like, no, I'm right here. Um, so I decided to grow out the beard, and um, honestly, it's a little bit of an experiment. Um, I, I thought maybe if I grow it out, maybe I show some of my age and some of the gray, maybe people would listen to me more. Uh, it's kind of, a, kind of a thought process there. So far, that experiment has not been fruitful. Um, but mama said I can grow it out. So as soon as she says it's over, I will be shaving. So it's really up to Jackie. Um, but anyway, people have opinions about the beard. They do. They tell, and they tell me, like out in public, like, yeah. You know, so uh, you can let me know. Just send me an email if you like it, you think I should keep it or shave it. Uh, there we go. So, brand new series, lots of fun. Uh, this series is called Habits That Grow Your Faith. I love talking about the concept, the idea of habits. It's one of my favorite things to read about, study. Uh, one of my favorite books on habits is called Atomic Habits by James Clear. Uh, he's sort of an expert on this issue, kind of a, a sequel to the book The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. And uh, I like the way James defines habit. He, in the book, he says that habits are small decisions you make and actions you perform every day. I, I, I like that. Another definition of a habit is something that you do so often and so repeatedly that you just do it without thinking. Uh, we've got good habits. We've got bad habits. Anybody have any bad habits out there? You bite your nails and pick your nose and... Maybe, you're, maybe you procrastinate, maybe you tend to overeat late at night. We all tend to have some bad habits. Maybe you smoke cigarettes, you know you should quit. Well, there's also good habits out there. Uh, anybody make like green smoothies every day? Yeah, yeah, so that's a good habit. Get those veggies in your body. Working out every day is a good habit, right? Drinking plenty of water is a good habit, right? So there's good habits, there are bad habits. I love talking about habits because habits have a shaping effect, they really do. In fact, one person said, you, you first make your habits, then your habits make you. Because habits have a forming effect for positive or for negative. And because habits have a forming effect, James Clear actually said this in the book. He said, your life is the sum of your habits. In other words, if you look at your life right now financially and you're like, you're in, good, you're in a good spot Financially, you've got an emergency fund saved, your bills are paid, and you, know, you have margin. It's because you have good financial, what? Habits. It's not rocket science, right? And if you're in bad shape financially, and you're like paycheck to paycheck, and if something goes wrong, you're sli sliding that credit card because you don't have any emergency fund, it's probably because of financial habits. Same thing with your physical shape. If you're in really good shape today and, and you're, you're at the right body weight and you have lots of energy and you, and you look good in the mirror, it's because of your, say with me, your habits. You know, if, you, if you're not in good shape and you don't like the way you look in the mirror and you know, you're disappointed where you can't walk up a flight of stairs without, <sighs> it's probably because of your habits. Your habits habits are, are, are a fo they form us. We are who we are because in large part of our habits. If you've got a great marriage today and you guys get along and, 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 and you go date nights and you're sweet to each other and you're, you're preferring each other and you're kind to one another and you talk gently to each other, sweetly to each other, it's probably because you got some good habits. And if you're at a bad marriage right now, it's probably because you got some bad habits in your marriage. You know, what's true in marriage and what's true in finances and what's true in your health and fitness is, is true in the spiritual life. It's no different. Like if right now, if you're like in a tight relationship with Jesus and you're walking with him and you feel his presence and, 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 and you're enjoying him and you feel him speaking to you, like it's probably because you have really good spiritual habits. And if you're distant from God right now and you don't sense him and feel him and you haven't prayed in a while and, and you're probably thinking, Pastor Danny, you're lucky I'm at church today or watching online because I don't really want to. Like it's probably because of your spiritual, your spiritual habits. The sum of our life is, is, is made up by our, by our habits. We are, the sum, we are the, the sum of our habits. I want to begin in a passage today in 1 Corinthians. It's a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a group of Christians, Christians in a city called Corinth. And he covers lots of topics. He actually wrote two letters, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. This passage I'm going to look at today with you guys is found in chapter 3 of the first letter. And I'm going to pull some truth out of what Paul says here. I read this passage many, 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 many years ago, and it really shaped my understanding 
personally of, of what my job is as a Christian, not a pastor, just as a Christian, man, like what am I really dealing with in life and in my own heart? So, so, so check this out. Paul says, dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, visited them, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people or spiritually mature people or people who were led by the Spirit. I had to talk to you as though you belonged to this world, as though you were, say it with me, you were infants in Christ, little baby Christians. Now, I know there's some baby Christians out there today because you got saved last week or reset or something else, and you're brand new to the Christian. He's not, that's not a, 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 a put down, or it's not condescending. Everybody's got to start somewhere, but when you first place your faith in Christ, you're an infant in Christ. You're brand new, three months old, six months old, seven months old, whatever. Paul says, there's, that some of you, I, could, I wanted to talk to you as if you were mature in your faith, but I couldn't because it was like you were infants in Christ. He says this, I wanted to, he says, I had to feed you milk, not with solid food. In other words, I wanted to feed you a steak. I wanted to cook you steak and potatoes. I wanted to make you a hearty meal, but I had to give you some, some, some milk instead because you weren't ready for anything stronger. And you still aren't ready for you are, and then this is the part I want to focus on. For you are still, what, controlled by your sinful nature. Did you know it's possible to be a Christian for a very long time? I mean decades. And still be controlled by your sinful nature. You're a Christian. You're saved. You prayed. Jesus is your savior. You're forgiven of your sins. If you die, you'd go to heaven. But you're still controlled by your sinful nature. You're still acting like an infant in Christ. That's possible. And that's true for many Christians today. And Paul goes on to give an example of what he's talking about. He says, guys, you're jealous of one another. You quarrel with each other. Anybody quarreling today with a spouse, a friend? Anybody struggling with envy or jealousy or comparison? Mm. Paul says, doesn't that prove that you're still, what, controlled by your sinful nature? Your jealousy reveals that you haven't quite matured in your faith. This has nothing to do with understanding who God is. This has nothing to do with knowledge of the Old Testament or, or, God, or any type of theology. This is just a character trait. There's jealousy in your heart. There's anger in your heart. Doesn't that prove you're still controlled by your sinful nature? Doesn't that prove that you're still a baby in Jesus? He's saying and if I put a steak in front of you, you can't even eat it. You can't even bite it because you don't have any teeth to chew it. <laughs> Aren't you living like people of the world? He's basically saying, come on, you should be further along than this. Here's a statement I want to make based on this passage. Ready? In your notes. When it comes to our faith, we're either controlled by the spirit or we're controlled by the sinful nature. See, when you become a Christian, you receive the Holy Spirit into your life, and then you begin this process of allowing him to control your life. And some of you just will not let him do it because you want what you want. And you're going to do things your way, and you're going to call the shots because you're the boss. And you have never surrendered to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. So therefore, envy and jealousy and lust and anger and all these different things still control your life. And Paul would say that we're infants in Christ. And so when we put our faith in Christ, that begins the process of you and I, myself included. Pastors don't get a pass on this, right? Anybody hear me ever talk about roundabouts? <laughs> we don't get a pass. We don't get a pass. We gotta deal with our selfishness. We gotta deal with our, our wanting our own way, right? When you put your faith in Christ, that begins the process of you and I trying to allow or allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us and control us. And everyone in this room, watching online, wherever you are, is somewhere along the line in that process, myself included. Listen to what Paul said in Galatians chapter five. He says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit, say it with me, guide your lives. You have to let that happen. You have to cooperate. You have to give him control. You gotta let him drive the car. Get out of the driver's seat, get in the back is what Paul is saying. And then when you and I do that, then what happens? Then you will not be, what? Satisfying the cravings of 
the sinful nature. You, you won't be doing what the sinful nature craves. You won't be involved in any type of inappropriate sexual activity. You won't be involved in any type of envy or jealousy. You won't be involved in any type of addiction or substance abuse because you've given up control. You ask me yes or no? And all of us are on different pages with this. We're all at different spots on, on this journey. But when we get this right, listen to me, this could change your life. When we get this right and we surrender the control of our life to the Holy Spirit, amazing things begin to unfold in our life. You say, what are you talking about? Well, look at verse 22 and 23. When we surrender, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, inner peace, instead of anxiety and stress. Can anybody use some of that? Right? Love, joy, peace. What, what about this one? Patience. Anybody have any children? Anybody raising any kids? I saw a lot of kids walk in here today. Some of you parents need this. You need this. Pay attention. We, Jack and I have raised three kids. We're still having to be patient with them. They're, they're, they live out of state now, and they're a little bit older, but mm, we still need patience. Where does that come from? The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in your life. As you surrender to the Holy Spirit, he's the one that produces these, these, these things, these wonderful, beautiful things. Kindness, gentleness, self-control. Wow, can you imagine having enough self-control to no longer scroll? Like some of you scroll, you can't stop. Like I understand, I have, I have my own addictions, I do, you know. I'm ashamed to maybe uh, admit some of them, but can you imagine having the self-control said, nah, I'm not gonna scroll anymore. Because some of you do hours and you can't stop because the, the videos are pretty interesting, aren't they? I mean, it's one after another of amazing videos. You ever see the shark ones? They just come in the shark ones that just come out of the water and they bite, they bite the boat and I'm like, oh, I could watch that forever. Another shark video, another shark video. And, I, and then what I do is I send them to my staff, right? I'm like, because I don't get in the ocean because sharks bite your legs off. And so... I'm, this is like evidence and proof. Like I, so I send them. I copy, send. How many copy and send videos? Scrolling, scrolling. It's fun for five minutes, but some of you are on there for two hours, right? We're having a little fun here, but we could use some self-control. Am I right or wrong? Let me give you a statement real quick. Let me give you a statement real quick because this, 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 is, this is all, I'm still in my introduction here. I haven't even started yet. <laughs> A spiritual person, here's a statement, ready? A spiritual person, Paul said, I wish I could talk to you as if you were spiritual people. A spiritual person is one who consistently demonstrates the character of Jesus. And what is the character of Jesus? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. That's what a spiritual person looks like. It's not a person who's got a PhD in theology or a master's degree in pastoral leadership or, 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 or any type of you know, uh, education in the Bible. That's not spiritual that's knowledge, but it's not spiritual maturity. You with me? There's a big difference between knowledge about God and Christ-like living and Christ-like character. Paul says, I wish I could talk to you as if people who no longer struggled with jealousy, who were not infants in Christ. A spiritual person is a person who's able to consistently demonstrate the character of Jesus. So in this series, I want to answer the question, how does that happen? Some people think, well, if I get baptized, then, then I'll be, then I'll be, then that will happen. Then I'll, then I'll be like Jesus. Or some people think if we just took communion more often, we have people ask, can we do communion more often? You know, a little juice, a little bread. Can we do that weekly? Maybe, maybe that would do it. Maybe if we did more worship nights, you know, because we got a worship night. They're awesome. We got one coming up next week. You should all come. Maybe if we did more worship nights, then we would become more, more like Jesus, right? How does this happen? Listen, if baptism could help you consistently demonstrate the character of Jesus, I promise you I would have a hose running and I wouldn't even fill up the tub. I would just take it and spray all of you in the crowd. Like if water could transform you, I would spray you. But those of you who've been baptized, you know you got baptized and it was a wonderful day and you told everybody you were a follower and you were, this, you were back doing the same thing the next day. Anger, jealousy, lust. Because baptism is like this, it's, it's a symbol. And I think you should get baptized, but baptism is like a wedding ring. This is my wedding ring. And when I put this wedding ring on, and when I did, uh, it, 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 20, how many years ago? 
24. Yes. 24 years ago when I put this ring on, this told everybody that I was a husband, but it didn't tell them what kind of husband I was. Maybe I'm a bad one. Maybe I'm average, right? The ring doesn't change me. It just tells people I'm married. Well, baptism's the same way. Like baptism, so what is it that actually changes us? And I'm gonna give you an answer that some of you are, are quite frankly, you're gonna send me an email. You say, I don't like that answer. Said, That's okay, send it. <laughs> Here's how we become spirit-led people. We become spirit-led people through the boring, horrible thing called habit. Nobody wants to hear that. Why do I say horrible? Because it's monotonous. It's just habit. It's not sexy. It's not fun. It's just blah. Habit. How do I become a spirit-led person? I become a spirit-led person through spiritual habits. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 40. From the mouth of the master himself. Students are not greater than their teacher. In other words, you're not going to become better than Jesus, right? But when the student who is fully, say it with me, trained. That's an interesting word, don't you think? You don't hear pastors talk a lot about training. But Jesus said it himself. When the student is fully trained, then the student will become like the teacher. What? What is Jesus saying here? He's saying, you want to become like me? You want to be like the master? You have to enter into a training program. Now, we get that when it comes to running marathons. Anybody ever run, run a half or a full? You're going to do tempo runs. You've got to do speed work. You've got to do long runs. I've lived that life for a while. It's lots of fun. It's rigorous. It's monotonous. It's boring. It's hard. It's difficult. But if you want to show up on race day and hit your time, you have to do your training program. Yes or no? You ever see, you ever go to the gym and you see these, these guys, you know, bench pressing, you know, 250 pounds, 280 pounds, sometimes 315 pounds. I mean, you three plates, four plates. Some guys, it's unbelievable how much weight these guys come up. How did they get there? I'm telling you, years of training. They didn't pray, Jesus, today I would love to bench press 275. Just, just. Just want to throw it up. Just get 275 on there. Would you just bless me today and help me to push that up today? That'd be great. A prayer won't do that. Do you agree? Yes or no? You can't pray your way to 275. You've got to train your way to 275. So if, if that's true in, in a weightlifting scenario or a, or a marathon scenario, why wouldn't that be true in the spiritual life? It is true in the spiritual life. Here's what Paul said to Timothy. Paul is mentoring Timothy. He's discipling him. Listen to what he says. Physical training is good. I love going to the gym. Some of you go to the gym, right? You see me there. I go, I go a lot. I love it. I enjoy it. It, it gives me energy, blah, blah, blah. I like to stay fit. I like to look good for mama. <laughs> Paul says, yeah, physical training is good. But training for godliness, far better. Yeah. Far better. Why? Because it promises benefits in this life and in the next life. Well, what benefits does godliness provide in this life? How about love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and that thing called self-control? And how about the ability to forgive and not hold a grudge, right? How about, how about the ability to live above temptation and not be dominated by sin? I mean, godliness is the way to go, but how do you get there? Paul says, training for godliness. I, 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 would, I would go as far as to say that, that not many of you have ever heard a pastor say, in order to be godly, you gotta work your butt off. Let me say it better. It takes intense effort to become godly. Probably not gonna hear anybody say that. You probably didn't think those verses were even in the Bible about training. You know the word training that Paul uses, the word, uh, uh, I can't say it, uh, genismo, it's the word, we get our English word gymnastics or gymnasium. It means to train with all your effort. That's the word Paul used when he said, train for godliness. Put everything you have into it, your mind, your body, your heart, your will, into becoming godly. I, I did a little research before this sermon this morning, and I, I wanted to know, like, uh, how many gallons of water does a person use to take a shower? It's an odd question, don't you think? On a Sunday morning, randomly pops into my head. 
Because here's what I know to be true. You cannot get clean in the shower with a few drops. You can't like let it drizzle out and you rub some shampoo and get some soap all over you. And then if the water, you can't, a few drops won't cut it, yes or no? Like you can't do it. You're gonna be stinky when you get out. You know, you're gonna smell like a sweaty dog. You know, sweaty, you know get back in, your spouse is in your, hey, try again. You need lots of water. You need lots of water. In fact, do you know what the average shower is in the United States, average time? person spends in the shower. It's just a weird piece of information. You're never going to forget it. It's about eight minutes on average. Now, some of you go 20. I don't know why. Some of you only do about two or three, maybe a little longer. It's about eight minutes. You know how many gallons of water come out of a, 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 a spigot in eight minutes on average? I looked it up. 17.2 gallons of water. That's a lot of water. I try to drink about a gallon a day. I can, sometimes I can't do it because one gallon is a lot. 17 gallons of water to get your stinky butt clean. <laughs> Did I just say that? <laughs> That's a lot of water. Here's, what, here's, what, here's my point on this illustration. Some of you think it's silly. It probably is. It takes a lot of water to get clean. It takes a lot of intensity to become godly. I, I, it's just what the Bible teaches. And some of you, some of you for maybe for the first time, you're like, uh, uh, man, I may, may, that makes sense. Maybe that's why this, Christ, this whole Christian thing's not working. All I do is attend services. Uh, and then you know, I'm expecting God to change my life. I never, I never thought I had to enter a training program. And some of you are hearing this and you're going, now wait a second, time out. I've always been taught that Christianity is a free gift and it doesn't require effort and it's all, it's all, you just all receive by faith. And, and that's true. Salvation is by grace through faith. It is not from yourselves. Paul says it is a gift from God, not by works so that no one can brag. But I'm not talking about going to heaven when you die. I'm not talking about getting saved. I'm talking about after you get saved, how do you become like Jesus? And that is the part that requires effort. Dallas Willard taught me years ago that growing in your faith is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. We're not earning God's favor when we do this. We're not putting in effort so that he could look down upon us and say, oh my gosh, I'm so pleased with you. No, he is pleased with you because of the blood of Jesus. Amen? You are totally accepted in him because of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. But now that you're accepted, now he says, okay, now I want to transform you into a new person and make you into a little Jesus. That's why Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, Work hard to show the results of your salvation. I mean, could it get any clearer than this? Work hard to show the results of what? Getting saved. So you got saved. Awesome. You prayed that prayer. Fantastic. Now let's deal with your jealousy. That's going to require work. Now let's deal with your insecurity and your narcissism. Now let's deal with the selfishness rooted down in your heart. Let's deal with that addiction you can't overcome. That is going to require hard work. Another version says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It takes intense effort to become godly. So, now, that's my introduction. Yeah. A long time. Sorry. But this is the first talk of four weeks, so I had to spend time developing. Now you know where we're going. So what I want to do in this series is I want to talk to you about four aspects of the training program. And really, they are four specific habits that I engage in to become godly. So really, I'm just showing my hand. I'm showing my cards. Like, this is what I do to become a God, as godly as I possibly can be. And did you know, by the way, you're, you are as godly as you want to be? Like, there's no limit. There's no limit. You can become as much like Christ as you want to. Okay. Just let that sink in. So this is the plan. Habit number one. You ready? Take notes. Got your phones out. Got your pens out. Habit number one to become like God, to become like Christ, is to engage Scripture. To engage Scripture. What am I talking about? I'm talking about engaging this book, reading it, rereading it, meditating on it, memorizing key passages, engaging this book. I was so blessed early on in my walk with Jesus that someone came alongside and showed me 2 Timothy chapter 3. Listen to what this says. All scripture is, watch this, breathed out by God. Another version says, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for what? For four things, reproof, correction, and for, I'm sorry, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and oh, there it is. You see it? 
Training in righteousness, training in godliness. So God has given us this book to literally show us what, what's right, what's not right, how to get right, and how to stay right. So early on, I took this book, and I didn't view it as a, a book uh, that is like a textbook or a history book. I viewed it as my training program. Right from the beginning, I'm like, okay, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this book so that I can become like Christ. Now, here's the thing with, with a lot of people, and, and I think dudes struggle with this more than, than the ladies do, and, and I know that's not a, a blanket statement, but generally speaking, reading the Bible, when, when guys hear that, okay, hey, you should read the Bible. Here's what guys hear, ready? It's like they're in the dentist the chair and the dentist says, you need to floss. <laughs> and everybody's like, yeah, I know. Yeah, I need to floss. And the dentist's like, no, you really do because if, if you don't, this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen. If you wanna maintain healthy teeth, you gotta floss. And then they even, and then the dentist gives you a couple of, 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 of you know, the little things, right? And then you take them home with a toothbrush and some toothpaste and you throw it in the drawer, right? You don't even, you don't even take it out. Or you might floss one time and then never again. And you know the whole time I should floss, but you don't do it. That's how we view reading the Bible. It's like, yeah, you know, Pastor Danny said, read the Bible. I know I should, but I ain't doing it. Because when I open it up, I have no idea what it says. I have no idea what it means. And so I'm just, I don't know why I should do it, but... I ain't doing it. And that's how we view it. And I'm here telling you today, like, this book is not a book. This is your training program. And the reason God gave it to you is so that you can become like Christ. And so when you open it up, you find out what God cares about, what he loves, what he hates. You, you find out what his will is. You find out what he thinks about sexuality and money and marriage and parenting. And it has everything in here for life. So if you viewed it that way, then you would pick it up every single day. And you would train every single day. So track with me. The question we ask in this series is, how do we become people who can consistently demonstrate the character of Jesus? We said the answer to that is habit, right? And the first habit is engaging the scripture. Listen to what the Bible says yeah. about the Bible. Sec yeah. Romans chapter 12. It says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Don't don't mimic the habits and behaviors of this world, but instead, watch this, let God transform you into a brand new person. How? By changing the way that you think. Now, that word transform is this Greek word metamorpho, and that word is the same word that we use for the, in the English. To, we got metamorphosis from that Greek word metamorpho. We use that word metamorphosis to describe the transformation of a caterpillar into a butterfly. Everybody tracking with me? You've all seen those videos. Same, you know, it's, it's the same substance of a creature, but the creature has changed from one thing to another thing. It has metamorphosed. It has, it has transformed. So Paul says that instead of copying the behaviors of the world, I want you to transform into a new person. And then he tells us how. By changing the way that you think. Now, if those of you up to date on the most recent brain science out there, it's all over the place. You can, you can Google it today and find out. You know, we know today that when you think a thought over and over and over, any thought, over and over and over and over again, it carves what's called a neural pathway in your mind. Everybody tracking with me? Once that neural pathway is carved in your mind, you're, 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 you're in a rut and it's really difficult to get out of that rut. Give you an example, a negative example. I'm unloved, I'm unworthy, nobody loves me, I'll never find someone to marry. Okay, that's a very common thought. You think that over and over, I'm unloved, I'm unworthy, I'll never find somebody, nobody will marry me. Over and over, and then someone else tries to say, man, you're loved and you're beautiful and you're gonna find a man one day. Nope, I cannot receive that. That is not true. What's true for me is that I will always be alone because I am unworthy, I'm unloved, I'm undeserving, and no one will marry me, right? Why? Because you've created a neural pathway. It's powerful. But you know what you can do? You can actually fill in that neural pathway and create a new one. This is what neuroscientists are telling us. It's called plasticity. You're literally reshaping the way that you think about yourself, about life. And then we read in the Bible, like Paul knew this. 
Like you change the way that you, 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 you transform your life by changing the way you think, by creating a new neural pathway. Listen to what he said in another passage in, Roman, in Ephesians chapter four. Paul said this, throw off your old sinful nature, your former way of life and behaving, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, watch this, let the spirit oh, create a new neural pathway. It's not what it says, does it? But almost let the spirit renew your thoughts, brand new thoughts about yourself. You can fill in those ruts and create a new neural pathway. I am loved. I am worthy. God has someone for me. One day I'm going to meet them. It may be soon. And when I do, it's going to be exciting and we're going to get married. And you can, you can literally form a new rut or rivet in your mind. And this is how, this is how we change. I'll give you an example today that is, uh, I think is going to be helpful for, for, for many of us today. In our world today, we live in a sex-crazed, lust-dominated world. What is lust? Biblically, lust is getting sexual satisfaction or fulfillment from a person that is not your spouse, not that, that you're not married to. It's objectifying a person for your own sexual Pleasure. That, that, is, that is what lust is. We live in a, a lust-crazed world. Every single day, 2.5 billion emails are sent and received that have pornographic material. Every single day, 68 million pornographic inquiries are typed into the internet. internet. 68 million. Every single second in our world today, 28,000 people are watching a pornographic video. Every second, every second, $3,000 is being spent on pornography. 3,000, 3,000, 3,000, 3,000. We live in a lust-crazed, sexualized world. And some of us here today have a lust problem. And you hate it. Because you know, you've read the Bible, you know that we're supposed to be pure, and Jesus talked about, those, you know, blessed are the pure in heart, for they'll see God, and he said, you know, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, you know, and, and if your right hand causes you to sin, chop it off. Like, you, you, you know that you are to be sexually pure, because that's what God calls you to do, but, but, but you've been trapped by lust, and it's got a grip on you, and you can't stop. Maybe, maybe you... You can't stop getting on dating apps and hooking up with people and having sex. I, I don't know. Maybe you can't stop looking at pornography. But, but there's a cost to that. And the cost is kind of built in. There's sexually transmitted diseases. There's unwanted pregnancies. There's, there's broken relationships. There's, uh, there's divorces. There's, I mean, when, when someone gets divorced in our community, in our church, and the question is asked, what happened? Most of the time, there is a pornography affair that has taken place. Not every time, but most of the time. Lust has entered in and, and, and there's been some, some, some form of unfaithfulness and adultery. How do we, how do we get control of that? Because as Christ followers, we're called to live a, a, much, a much different way, in a, pu- in a pure way. Well, we actually have to change the way that we think about lust. Listen to what Job said. Try this on for size. Let this carve a new pathway in your brain. Job says, lust is a shameful sin, a crime that should be punished. Well, I think the punishment is built in. But the government doesn't have to punish us for lusting. We pay the consequences ourselves. He says, lust is a fire that burns all the way to hell. There's a thought. One time Jesus said, cut your right hand off for it's better for you to enter into heaven with one hand than to go into hell with two. The context was sexual sin. Wow. And then Job says this, it would wipe out everything I own. You know, if we passed a microphone today at your campus, wherever you're at, here, online, I guarantee we would have hundreds of people grab, them, grab the microphone and say, lust ruined my life, I had an affair, she divorced me. Pornography ruined my life. She found out she divorced me. I now have an addiction. Hundreds of us. Because what Job said is true. 
It would wipe out everything I have. Lose my relationship with my daughter, my son, my wife, my husband. Years ago, years ago, I was so blessed to have another man come alongside of me and and show me something that changed the way I thought about lust. Because as a young guy growing up in New York, you know, I didn't, it just was whatever. Had no control. Was not a Christ follower. Uh, didn't understand uh, what God wanted, what his will was. And so lust was an issue for me, just like it is for, 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 for most people. So I get saved, and then I, have a, a, I ask a friend of mine to, like, how do you deal with lust? And he showed me a passage that changed my life. He showed me a passage that gave me a new neural pathway. He showed me a passage that changed the way I think about, about women. Watch this. Paul tells Timothy, treat the older women as you would your, say it with me, your, your mom. Let that sink in. You see an attractive older woman? That's mom. (laughs) Well, that changes things. Doesn't it? It sucks away all the sexual connotations, all the, like, there's just not, there's no, no, that's not there. Mom. And then he says, treat the younger women with all purity as you would your own sisters. I never had a sister, but I've become a grown man and now I have a daughter. Paul could have said, if Timothy was a little bit older, he could have said, treat the younger women, as you would your, your daughter, with all purity. See, what that does is that removes any sexuality between you and anybody that you might find attractive or whatever. That's my mom, that's my sister, that's my daughter. So right out here as I'm looking at all you pretty people, <laughs> mom, sister, daughter. Some of you are like, you better call me your sister. Okay, sis, you're my sis. Now, if you're a lady, if you're a lady, just flip it, just flip it. If you're a lady and you have a problem with lust, every older man, hey, pops, hey, dad, daddy, daddy o. <laughs> if it's a younger guy your age, it's, hey, bro, brother, or your son. And when you, what is, what, is, what is Paul telling Timothy to do here? He's given him a different way to think about the opposite sex because the opposite sex is not supposed to be objects of lust. The same sex is not supposed to be an object of lust. People are not objects of lust. People, I don't know if you know this, according to Genesis 127, people are made in the image of God. They're not objects to be lusted after. They're creatures to, to love and be cherished and honored as individual people created in the image of the living God. And you start thinking that way about people, lust, it, it, it's, it's eliminated. It's, it's, it's just not part, it's not part of the equation. Now, what am I saying today? That I'm 100% free of lust? No. But man, my life has been transformed from caterpillar into a butterfly. What did Jesus say? Here's how he said it. Watch this, ready? If you continue in my word then you'll truly be my disciples and then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Say it louder. Free. Free from what? Anger, lust, jealousy, whatever. But you have to continue in this book every single day. So what did I do this morning? You guys know what I did this morning at 5.30. You know what I did? What did I do? I'm almost on my back porch reading through this book. I'm going through Psalm 1, I'm going through Psalm 23, I'm going through Psalm 16, I went through Psalm 46, I went through Psalm 139, I've read the passages over and over and over again. Why? Because this book changes who we are. When you change the way you think, you change your life. So, I don't have a question today, I have a challenge. Usually I have a question, right? My challenge today for you is to memorize Psalm 23 this week. You say, oh, that's a big challenge. Well, there's only six verses, and they're really short. It goes like this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's verse one. That's easy, right? We could do that right now. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Verse two, he makes me lie down in green pastures. 
He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul, right? Some of you know it. Some of you already know it. Even though I walk, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Why do I have that memorized? I assure you, it is not because I'm a pastor. I promise you. It is not my job to memorize Psalm 23 because I'm your pastor. It is 100% because I know that if I want to be a different person, I have to transform the way that I think. And so what I try to do is I try to live, live through the lens of Psalm 23. Life is lived through the scriptures. As life comes at us, when we have the scriptures memorized, we interpret life through the lens of scripture. And then we react and respond the way Jesus would because we have his thoughts. Is this making sense? So, so your homework this week is to take tomorrow, tomorrow, Psalm 1, Psalm 23, verse 1. Just Monday, just do, just do verse 1. Okay, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Tuesday, verse 2, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Then go verse 3 Wednesday, go and go verse, verse 4 Thursday, verse 5 Friday, verse 6 on Saturday. And then next week when you come back, because everyone's coming back, right? Everybody's coming back? On Sunday, what we'll do is we will recite it together in the English Standard Version because that's the one I have memorized. (laughs) And together, next week, we're going to do it out loud together at all of our campuses. And we're going to hide God's Word in our hearts, and we're going to transform our lives by changing the way that we think. Yes? Good stuff? Awesome. I said a few moments ago that Paul told Timothy to train ourselves in godliness. It's actually far better to train in godliness than it is to physically train our bodies. Why? Because the training in godliness has promises and benefits for this life now and for the next. What is he talking about? Paul is talking about love and joy and peace, and he's talking about the abundant life in Christ. There's no better life than life with Jesus. And then when you die, You go on to experience heaven after you die. Promises in this life and in the life to come. Some of you have not yet opted in on that. Maybe because you think that that, that this is all religion and church and, and please don't get distracted by that. I personally don't even really like church. I like our church. I hate religion because religion is basically a system that man creates to try to, you know, get people controlled and but what, what Jesus came to bring is not, he didn't come to build churches or, or create a religion. He came to walk with you and talk with you and to give you a life that is satisfying and fulfilling. And that's what I'm talking about today. And some of you have not opted in on that yet. And I wanna invite you to do it now. It, it's, 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 it's faith. You reach out to Jesus, you acknowledge that you've fallen short of his standards, broken his laws, and you need forgiveness. And he died for you. And he bled for you. And he came back to life to give you that life. And so right now, wherever you're at, if you're watching online, you're at a microsite or a campus, I'm gonna ask you to just close your eyes and bow your heart if you're here at Stones Crossing and you don't have a relationship with Christ, take this moment and make it yours. Will you pray with me? Just say this to him, dear Jesus, I need you. I've fallen short. I've messed things up. I've tried to live on my own. And so I turn to you today. And I put my trust in you. And I ask you to forgive my sins. Cleanse my heart. I declare that I believe in you. That you are my savior. Wash me clean. Cleanse my heart. Make me your son or daughter. And from this day forward, teach me to follow you. Train me to become like yourself. I pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Amen. Can we give God glory, church? Amen.
If you just prayed that prayer, I want to do something for you that someone did for me. I want to put a Bible in your hands inside this box. There is a New Testament to get you started on your new relationship with Christ. If you would text the word SAVE to 65248, we would love to put one of these in your hands at the information desk at your campus. If you are watching online, give us a little bit more info and we'll send one to you in the mail. There's also a special gift in here from us to you. Can we give it up one more time for what God is doing across all of our campuses? Amen. Hey, before you guys get out of here, I know you want to scat. It's hard to get out of here at the parking lot and, and here at Greenwood. Uh, um, but hey, one more thing I want to mention to you. Recently, I put together seven short videos for those uh, folks who just put their faith in Christ recently. We've called it our, our Come and Grow series. And if you actually go, I don't have my phone, sorry. But if you go to our church app, you can find this series on there. There are four to five minute videos talking about what is faith? Why should I read the Bible? What is, why should I get baptized? Why should I be in a small group? All that stuff. You can go to our app or you can go to eclife.org forward slash the grow series and you can find it on our website there as well. Let's pray and then I'll dismiss the local teams. Father, we love you. Thank you so, from, so much for this new series. Help us to grow in our faith. Help us to build these habits in our life to mature and become like your son. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Right now, I'm going to hand things off to the local teams. Love you guys. See you next week. All right. Thanks, Pastor Danny. That's a wrap for week one of Habits to Grow Your Faith. Hey, follow us on social media this week on Instagram and Facebook. They're going to be at the bottom of your screen, our handles. We got a lot coming at you with this series, a lot of things that you could do to help grow in your faith. Again, follow us on social. If you made the decision to follow Jesus, congrats to you. Uh, make sure you text SAVE 65248 so I can send you your SAVE box in the mail. Well, thank you again for being a part of our service. Pastor Danny continues this series next week. Can't wait to be a part of it. You guys have an awesome week and bring a friend. Hey families, welcome to our online campus kids ministry. We're so glad you're here with us today. If this is your first time tuning in, we would love for you to text hello to 65248 so we can say hi and welcome you. We have an amazing time planned for you today. Now, if you're a fifth or sixth grader, you can find your content on our website at eclife.org slash kidswatch. Parents, if you want to rewatch today's content and get some awesome follow-up activities, you can also head to eclife.org slash kidswatch. Let's get things started with Ollie and our preschool friends today. Last week, we began learning that we can do what Jesus says. Jesus shows us how to be patient and kind. You can do what Jesus says and shine your light every day. We're going to learn more about how we can do what Jesus says, but first, let's worship together.
Oh, hi friends, it's me, Luca. These are some super cool night lights. They aren't shining yet, but if I put one in my room at night, it'll help me see in the dark. Only I like them all, and I can't decide which one to put in my room. Do you know which one I should put in my room? If I put the astronaut nightlight in my room, it'll be like going to outer space every night. And if I put the shark nightlight in my room, it'll be like going on a deep sea adventure. And if I put the frog nightlight in my room, I might want to hop like a frog all night. They're all great nightlights, but I just don't know which one to put in my room. Who? Who? It's Ollie! Hello, Luca. Who? Who? What are those lights with you? Oh, hi, Ollie. I have all of these nightlights, but I'm trying to pick one to put in my room. Nightlights shine in the dark. It's true. I have a story how you can shine too. Listen up. Just follow me through. Who? Who? Follow me through. Follow me through. Hi friends, I'm Carrie the dog walker. It is so great to see you. We are having a light parade in the neighborhood tonight and we all need a light to shine. So I'm bringing this flashlight. Oh, it's my best dog Stormy Jane. Looks like she's ready for the light parade too. That reminds me of a Bible story. Do you wanna hear it? <laughs> I guess Stormy's ready. Today's true story from the Bible begins on a mountain with Jesus and his friends, the disciples. While they were on the mountain, Jesus gave his friends an important job to do. What do you think the important job was? Do you think he told them to be a firefighter? Do you think he told them to be mail carriers? Do you think he told them to be teachers? Those are really important jobs. But Jesus had one important job for everyone. It's so, so, so important. Jesus said to go and tell everyone, everywhere, that Jesus wants to be their friend forever. Jesus said to go and tell. Wow, that's a very important job. And guess what? We can do what Jesus says. We can tell people about Jesus. Can you say, Jesus wants to be your friend forever? Ready? Jesus wants to be your friend forever. Great job, you guys. And when we go and tell people about Jesus, we are shining our light. <laughs> now let's think about some people we could go and tell about Jesus. There are so many places we can go and tell. Oh, look, it's a team practicing soccer. Say, Jesus wants to be your friend forever. Ready? Jesus wants to be your friend forever. Great job. Now, where else can we go? Yes, we can go and tell our friends at the playground. Let's say Jesus wants to be your friend forever. Ready? Jesus wants to be your friend forever. Wow, you are really good at this. Let's do one more. Oh, look, it's a grandma. We can go and tell our grandma about Jesus. Ready? Jesus wants to be your friend forever. Great job. When we go and tell everyone everywhere that Jesus wants to be their friend forever, we are doing what Jesus says and shining our light. <laughs> oh, hey there, Ollie. Ollie, tell me, who can do what Jesus says? I can do what Jesus says. Yes, it's true. Now let's hear it from you. Tell me. Who can do what Jesus says? I can do what Jesus says. That's the truth, friends. See you next time. Bye. So there's your story, and it's all true. Telling others about Jesus is a shining thing to do. Thanks, Ollie. Goodbye to you. Ho, ho. Wow, Jesus said to go tell others about him. We shine when we go and tell 
everyone everywhere about Jesus. I think I got the story. Did you get it? If you did, say got it. Get it? Got it! Good! I've got an idea. I'm gonna put this card night light in my room so it'll remind me to go tell everyone everywhere about Jesus. And I'm gonna start right now. See you next time. Wow, Jesus said to go and tell others about him. We shine our light when we do what Jesus says. So let's go and tell everyone everywhere that Jesus is alive and Jesus wants to be their friend forever. Preschool friends, thank you for joining me today. I'll see you next week and bring a friend. Now it's time for our elementary friends. Last week, we started talking about patience. Remember, patience is waiting until later for what you want now. It's tough when we have to wait for something we really want, but God can help us to wait. Well, by choosing to be patient, I can wait for you to learn more about patience. But first, let's worship together. Welcome to Story Lab. This week we're talking about patience. Huh, I see what you did there. Plus some real fruit ninja action and the most expensive bowl of soup of all time. Ooh, this intro is making me hungry. Let's go. Hey, I'm Carter. And I'm Zeke. And today, we're talking about patience. Which is waiting until later for what you want now. Hey, Zeke, do you want a chocolate bar? <laughs> of course. Wait, is this some kind of trick question? It is a trick question. I knew it. How so? Because you can have this chocolate bar now, 
Okay. Or... Oh, here comes the trick. Or you can have an even bigger chocolate bar. There's gotta be some catch. If... If you wait until later. Well, how big? Can't say. Ugh. Well, how long do I have to wait? But I don't like waiting. Oh. You might even say... Here we go. I have a weighty problem. Well, here's the thing to remember. No one is making you wait. You really can have this chocolate bar now. It's totally up to you. Okay, I'll wait. I mean, this is good, but if I hold out, I'll get something even better, right? Yes, you will. Okay, so, waiting. Yep. Just gonna do some good old-fashioned waiting. Mm-hmm. Call it. Mm-hmm. Wick McWaiterson. That's right. Just gonna keep on waiting. Wanna blow up a watermelon? That works. Let's do it. To explode a watermelon, we'll need. Wait, no, let me guess. A watermelon? Yep. I got one left over from my family's cookout. Hey, watch this. Ding. And rubber bands. Oh. Ding. Nope. More. More? <sighs> Not yet. What? Yeah. <sighs> that is a lot of rubber bands. Yeah, indeed. We'll need as many as 500 or even more. And just for fun. <sighs> now. We start putting on the rubber bands. There goes the first one. Oh yeah, we got many, many more to put on. Oh. Okay, so when do we get to the explosion part? Well, when these rubber bands are stretched out, they contain potential energy. But when they eventually contract, what was potential will become real. That action is called kinetic energy. Huh, so potential energy is stretched and kinetic energy is boom. Now, less talking, more rubber banding. Okay, that's 200 rubber bands. Time for a break? Well, is it time for my chocolate bar? No. What about now? Well, I just realized what this experiment is really about. And what's that? Patience. Ah, oh, tricked into learning. Hey, do you think it's starting to crack? Ooh, ooh. Right there. No, it's just wishful thinking. Huh, well, I guess we gotta keep going. Let's go. Okay. Yeah. And right on the center. Yep. All right. All right. Uh, uh, hey, wait a second. We're all out of rubber bands. Hey, but you've got more rubber bands, right? At the store. You mean we can't finish? You're going to have to just wait a little longer. No! But while we wait, it's time for... The story before the story. Today, we're in the book of Genesis, where it all began. God created an amazing world, but people turned away from God and chose to go their own way. God chose a man named Abraham and promised to bless the whole world through his family. But this didn't happen right away. Abraham and his wife Sarah had to wait. And wait. And wait. Finally, after years and years of waiting, Abraham's son, Isaac, was born. And when Isaac grew up, he and his wife, Rebecca, also had to wait a long time for a family. 
But at last, they had twin boys, Jacob and Esau. And that is where our story starts. Take it away. Hey everyone, I'm Brian. In the book of Genesis, we meet twin brothers. Esau was born first and he was very hairy. Minutes after Esau, Jacob was born and he was very not hairy. Hey, do you have any uh, brothers or sisters? Do you sometimes fight with them? Mm -hmm. Well, Esau and Jacob wrestled with each other before they were even born. And while these brothers may have had the same mom and dad, <laughs> that's where their similarities ended. Esau was a hunter, which he may have learned from his dad. And there was nothing Esau loved more than being out in nature. The wilder and more dangerous, the better. Meanwhile, Jacob was just the opposite. He just preferred hanging out closer to home. In fact, he was his mom's favorite and became quite a chef. One son wild, the other one mild. So one day Jacob was cooking some stew outside the tent where his family lived when his hairy, dusty, and probably smelly brother Esau showed up. Now Esau had been out hunting all day. He was hungry, he was angry, he was hangry. Hey, bro, I am starving. Give me some of that red stew you're cooking up. Oh, but not so fast, because while Esau smelled food, Jacob smelled an opportunity. For real, I'm gonna literally die. I haven't eaten in hours. Give me some food. You want some of this? This delicious, steaming, savory stew? Bruh. Okay, you can have this food, but uh, only as a payment. You have to sell me your rights as firstborn. Pause button. Rights as a firstborn? What does that mean? Well, at this time, the oldest son in a family was always given certain privileges that his younger brothers wouldn't get. Like getting the family's money and stuff when his father passed away. And the opportunity to eventually lead the family. It was a big deal. Something Esau had that Jacob wanted. In short, it was a really big deal. I mean, nothing you would ever sell for any price. And yet, it was also something a firstborn son would have to wait to enjoy. And Esau didn't want to wait. He was hungry right now. And so, he agreed to Jacob's offer. Yeah, sure. I'll sell you my rights as firstborn. What good are they to me anyway? It's not like I can eat them if I literally die. Now let's be real, Esau was not about to die of starvation. But Jacob gave Esau some lentil stew, and with that, Esau gave away his rights as the firstborn son. So was that the end of it? I mean, Esau just got a bad deal buying the world's most expensive bowl of lentil soup? Sadly, no. Because of Esau's impatience, many bad things happened, including a lot of fighting within the family. Esau wouldn't wait, and so he missed out on a lot of... Good things. The end. Wow, that's a powerful lesson about waiting. But also kinda, what's the word? A bummer. Yeah, just think about how bad Esau must have felt once he finished that stew and realized what he had done. It's true, a lot of bad things did follow Esau's choice, but guess what? Eventually the brothers made up because no matter how impatient we get, God never gives up on us. So, what's our part in the story? Patience is waiting until later for what you want now. So when you think there's no way you can wait, like Esau, stop and think again. Like when you have to wait for screen time until after you finish your homework or chores. You can get mad and yell at your mom and maybe completely lose your screen time. Or you can... Ah, take a deep breath and remember your mom probably put that rule in place to help you even if it doesn't feel like it right now. It can also be super hard to wait if dad says you can't have a snack because it's too close to dinner time. Or to wait until your birthday to get something you really, really, really want now. Exactly. That's what I do. Waiting is tough, but God promises to give us patience when we ask. When we follow Jesus, God sends the Holy Spirit to live inside us. Patience is a gift from God's Spirit. And waiting time doesn't have to be wasted time. Yeah, you could use that time to do something creative. Or find a way to help someone out. Yes and yes. Well, 
I'm still not a huge fan of waiting, but I can see how God can help you wait. That's great. We'll see you guys next time. If you can wait that long. <laughs> so, here's the thing. When you think you can't wait, think twice. Now do we get to finally finish our watermelon explosion? Still out of rubber bands, but I did put together this special montage to reward your patience. Oh. That was awesome sauce! Hey, what, what's that sound? What, what's going on? Remember how you chose to give this up and wait for something better? Oh, right, yeah. It's coming. What's coming? Your chocolate bar. Oh, right, right there's fine, right there's fine. Thank you. All right, see you guys next time. Thank you. Ugh. Ugh. Okay, uh, here it is, your chocolate bar. <sighs> it's, it's beautiful. So worth the wait. Yeah. Thanks for joining us in the story lab. See, See you, you next, next time. time. Well, open oh, it up, Oh, man. yeah, yeah. Open it up. Oh. yeah. yeah. Mm. Look at that. Oh, it smells so good. Oh, it smells so, so good. chocolatey. Esau was so hungry that he didn't think he could wait one more second. He didn't have patience, and because of that, he gave up his rights as the oldest son. Eventually, Jacob and Esau made up and fixed their relationship. But Esau's choice wasn't something he could take back. It was done for good. So what can we learn from Esau's impatience? think twice. Today I want you to remember this. When you think you can't wait, think twice. Stop and ask God to help you make the wise choice so you don't end up doing something you regret. Whatever situation you find yourself in, you can always ask God to help you wait. I've had such an amazing day with you. We'll see you next week and bring a friend.